Well, good afternoon. Now, I'm here to talk about time. Time particularly in aviation. Now, we're going to be talking about GNSS, GPS, of course, which you know, GPS is a subset of GNSS. And forgive me because I switched between the two terms a few times during the presentation. So let's use them interchangeably for the moment. Now, a little bit about me and the organization I work for. We are red teamers and pen testers, but we spend a lot of time working in aviation. Uh, during COVID, a lot of airplanes were laid up and we got to do some vanilla research working on retired airplanes, which is great fun. You learn a great deal very quickly about some very new and very old systems too. Uh, along the way, we've advised several airlines, several manufacturers. We're on very good terms with Boeing and uh, we've had the great opportunity to do some vanilla research on systems such as collision avoidance um, systems, instrument landing systems, and also electronic flight bags, which I gave a talk about yesterday. Anyway, who am I? Well, I'm a really bad pilot. I have had so many bad incidents happen to me. I've landed at the wrong airport by mistake once. That was embarrassing. I had my engine quit on me once. Fortunately, it happened just after I took off. The runway was long, we were fine. I've had my undercarriage hang up twice. That was a bit awkward, and I've very nearly crashed into three other airplanes. So whatever you do, don't fly with me, it's really bad. And uh, navigationally, I also accidentally trolled air traffic control. I was there when I was actually there. That caused a bit of a consternation as well, but hey. Fortunately for you, I never made it to commercial. I studied, but I never made it to the airlines, which was a bit of a shame. So instead, back in 2002, I founded a pen testing firm. Um, but I do still fly for in general aviation and the sort of fun things I like flying. Uh, my favorite airplane is the Piper Cherokee 6. I love it. Um, I also went out to uh, Eastern Europe to learn to fly old Russian airliners, which are great fun. Uh, I fly multi-engine airplanes too, but probably the scariest thing I ever did was flew into Courcheval Altiport, which is in Courcheval in France. It was built for the 1992 Olympics and the runway is at an angle of 20 degrees. If you come in, and you get it wrong, basically you crash. You can't put the power on, go around and try again because there's a mountain in the way. And often what happens, and if you go to YouTube, you'll see this, is people land with a bit too much speed and come screeching across the ramp, brakes on fire and go plowing into the snowbank. There's a, a, quite a recent one of a Piper Aztec that went piling in. What they don't show you in the photograph is there is a bar right on the left there with a viewing gallery and everyone sits there and waits for the airplanes to crash. Amazingly, in the 30-something uh, years it's been open, only two people have been uh, very seriously injured in that time. But they do have lots of, lots of crazy things. Anyway, I want to talk about what I'm not. I am not an expert in GPS. It's not my field. I'm not a commercial pilot, fortunately for you. Um, but what I do want to talk about is a series of incidents that I've been told about, that have been published, some haven't. And I'm not going to give answers. What I think I would like to stimulate from this is hopefully you're interested in the space too. Go and start asking questions. Go and start learning about GPS and go and learn about some of the interesting issues that we started seeing over the last couple of years. So I spent a lot of time working in aviation. I know quite a bit about flying airplanes. I know quite a bit about the navigation systems. I know quite a bit about the cybersecurity of airplanes too. And I know lots of airlines. We're on really good terms with all sorts. I also know about people and how pilots interact, how we manage the, co the cockpit resources, and why things go wrong. I have this very weird fascination with reading instant reports about aviation crashes. One thing I love more than anything about the aviation industry, it is safe. And the reason it's safe is we find out what went wrong, and then we write it up without blame, and we share it. Imagine if we could do that in the cybersecurity industry, hey? That is why flying is so safe. Anyway, if just before we go there, it's really, really important that if you find vulnerabilities in aviation, you disclose them responsibly and ethically. It takes a long time to fix things in airplanes. Why? Because we need to be safe. You can't go and drop it like it's hot in aviation. You can't do 90 days Google Project Zero style. Code in aviation has to be certified to make sure it's safe. You can't just push a patch to a plane. It can take a couple of years to fix a vulnerability on an airplane. And for those of you who've seen press reports about planes being hacked from a seat back in coach, 
No, it doesn't work like that. You can't. The networks are segregated. They don't do that. And there's always someone in control up front. When everything else goes wrong, you've got pilots up there. And that's what they're paid to do. They're paid to fly safely. So, a little bit of a recap. We need to go back to basics. We're going to go back to what I like to think of as steam-powered instance. One of the very earliest types of navigation aid was a non-directional beacon. It's simply got an indicator in your cockpit that points at the beacon. It's as simple as that. Very straightforward. Um, has very long range because it follows the, um, the curvature of the Earth. Unfortunately, there are some weaknesses, uh, one of which being if you're navigating in instrument conditions, so in cloud, and there's thunderstorms going on, it'll point at the thunderstorm. So you fly towards the thunderstorm instead of where you were hoping to go. Very cheap to operate. Uh, you often find them in very remote locations. So northern Canada, there are still quite a lot of NDBs around because um, they've got great range, cheap to operate, and there's not a huge amount of aviation traffic out there at low level. You do still find them. They'll often be the markers or locators on an instrument landing system. So as you fly in, if you lift in the cockpit, you'll hear the outer marker, middle marker, inner marker. Huge advances were made with the VOR. These came to uh, be used in, I think, 1947 they first emerged, and they were not affected by the same issues with NDBs. They didn't point at thunderstorms and make you fly into lightning, which is great, we like that. Uh, they're probably easier to use and follow, and they're undoubtedly more accurate, but they are only line of sight. NDB follows the curvature of the Earth, VOR, line of sight. And these are typically found at the intersections of airways. When you're flying airway to airway, a turning point will often be accompanied by a VOR on the ground. And if you're ever looking out of the window and you feel the airplane turn, you might want to look down and you might just see this round thing on the ground. That's a VOR. But they are expensive. They're expensive to maintain. And they don't give you altitude information. They give you a direction. Whereas GPS gives you very precise point in space and time. So because they're quite expensive to maintain, because we've got GPS, which is a lot better, they're starting to be retired. So they're starting to disappear. We also use DME, use DME, which is essentially a bit like a submarine ping. You send a ping, get a response, time of flight gives you distance, and it's actually very accurate. We use DME typically on an instrument landing system approach. At some point during that approach, we will check DME to make sure that we are the correct distance from the, the runway. ILS. You've probably seen these, you see them at the end of the runway. Yep, that's the localizer. They're amazing bits of equipment, incredibly precise, given it's radio based, and allows us to make an approach in what we call Cat 3C. So, completely fogged out, the airplane can still land safely with a combination of a radio altimeter. The only minor issue with the instrument landing system is it can give false glide slopes. So, Typically, an ILS is aligned at a three degrees angle. And you'll also have false signals at six degrees, so at multiples, nine degrees, 12, etc. So as a re the result of that, we always used to approach the instrument landing system by flying under it. We'd intersect the, um, the, uh, the glide slope, and then we'd get clearance to descend. So we wouldn't typically approach from above, because you might end up picking up one of the false um, GPS approaches but they're really expensive to maintain. They're incredibly expensive to build, and they're incredibly expensive to maintain because you have to calibrate them. And there's in this incredible process involving mirrors. So there'll be mirrors set up on the runway, and then you'll have a calibration airplane will then fly down, signing lasers off the mirrors and make sure it's correctly calibrated. It's expensive. As a result of that, a lot of regional airports are starting to retire their instrument landing systems. Why? Because we've got GPS. GPS is more accurate. Fantastic. And you're starting to see LPV approaches take over where, uh, where ILS was used before. An example of that, so runway 19 right hand in Las Vegas itself is a GPS approach. The other major runways still have instrument landing systems, but if you're approaching from the north, you'll typically find a, uh, a GPS-based approach. We also use inertial reference. So back in the day, when you were flying something like a 707, you had a navigator on board. 
and that navigator would have had a sextant and there was also a periscope in the roof like there is on the B-52 and they would literally do celestial sightings using a, uh, a sextant and work out where they are. Now, now we no longer have navigators, we don't really have that option. So inertial reference was used, particularly where we're not flying over land, where we don't have ground-based beacons, and it means that uh, simply relying on a very, very accurate accelerometer, the one on the right is the, uh, the uh, inertial reference system from Concorde, gyro-based, and the one on the left is uh, the much more recent version, which is laser-based gyros. They are so accurate that on a 3,000 nautical mile flight from, say, London to New York, you could be as little as one nautical mile off position which is phenomenal advances, but actually not great if you then want to approach and land. Right? You need to be a bit better than one nautical mile away from the runway. That would be a bad day. So, as we're starting to see conventional nav aids start to be retired, because they're expensive and not as accurate, we're starting to see them being removed. And particularly the VORs that are off airway routes, they're being retired. Uh, there's also a lot of VORs are still part of the approach, so for example a standard approach route or a standard instrument departure will often involve a VOR. Um, uh, one of my favourite, I, I why do I have a favourite VOR? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there's a proposal to recover a Delta Tango, sorry, retired Delta Tango Yankee, which is a critical part or was a critical part of a number of the standard approaches into London's Heathrow. Ten years ago, we had 44 VORs in the UK. We're now down to below 19. So we're starting to rely increasingly on GPS. Now, let's look at some of the instances that we've, uh, we've stumbled onto. I would strongly recommend, if you want to learn more about this, go and follow the Ops Group. Really interesting grouping, gathering data, have real-time GPS um, spoofing and jamming reports. Now, as I'm sure you've started to see, we're starting to see position errors particularly around areas of conflict. There's a lot going on in Eastern Europe, in the Ukraine, obviously. And part of that, we believe, is there to mitigate drone-based attacks. So a lot of consumer um, drones, rather than military drones, are being used. They rely on GPS in some cases. So to mitigate an attack, you would jam or spoof GPS. We saw a lot of jam jamming and spoofing going on in the Black Sea, but that was typically for shipping. So around military installations in the Black Sea, you'd often get a 20 nautical mile position error uh, when you were at sea. It's increased massively though. The last uh, report I read had a 400% increase, which is huge. We're seeing moves away from jamming towards position errors. Uh, position can be incredibly interesting. Now, for safety reasons, when we're approaching to land, we will have the ground proximity warning system. So if we descend too low or we start flying towards hills, which would be really bad, the GPWS will um, give us an alert and say, too low, pull up. So we're OK. But if you've got a position error, you're flying down your ILS, the GPWS thinks you're somewhere else because it's being spoofed and triggers. The first thing you have to do is go around. So we're seeing numerous flights have to go around and try again because they're getting position errors are triggering the uh, ground proximity. We're also seeing some interesting issues around poisoning. Now, inertial reference, I mentioned there, it's not as accurate, right? It's great, but it's not as accurate as GPS. So therefore we would deprecate to GPS as the most accurate source of position and time on the airplane. So the RS will be updated by the GPS pretty frequently. So when we start to see position errors, what we're then starting to see is the inertial reference then becomes poisoned by GPS. And one of the instructions to pilots is if you are experiencing spoofing or likely to experience spoofing, you would then switch from GPS to inertial reference so you don't see poisoning going on. We've seen anecdotal reports pop up around airplanes not able to reacquire. You go into an area of spoofing, you lose GPS, you then leave the area of spoofing and jamming some distance later. Now, in order to see the satellites in the skies, you need to know where they are, and that's your satellite almanac, which is part of your GPS system. The multimode receivers which will gather that data, we've seen reports where you get beyond the jamming area and the MMR can't now reacquire the signal because the satellites aren't where it thinks they are. There have been all sorts of reports of course position jamming 
causing problems around areas of a, perhaps what we might call hostile airspace. Places we wouldn't really want to fly into where maybe it's a war zone or an unfriendly hostile nation. You do not want to be accidentally flying into their airspace. That reset process, if they're no longer working, needs to be done on the ground. So the plane's no longer moving, it can reacquire correctly. Interestingly, more modern multimode receivers don't seem to be as vulnerable. They seem to be better at reacquiring after as compared to some of the older multimode receivers that are in slightly older airplanes. Really interesting. I haven't got to the bottom of that. Now, when we do see um, GPS jamming and spoofing going on, there'll often be a notice to airmen, a NOTAM. And that tells the pilots, look, you're really likely to receive some um, jamming or spoofing problems there. So before you go there, switch. But remember, we're retiring older based nav aids. We're starting to retire our instrument landing systems in favor of GPS. But now we've got position problems. And there was a really interesting instant at uh, Tartu Airport in Estonia. So Finnair suspended their flights. They were flying ATR 72s in there, I believe. And they started to experience G um, GPS spoofing and jamming and couldn't safely approach the airport. So they suspended flights for a couple of months while they looked for other sources of data. And they ended up settling back on distance measuring equipment to ensure that if they were spoofed, they could correctly approach that airport. But we started to see these issues affecting real flights. But where I really want to move on to is the concept of time. We think too much, to my mind, about GPS being a source of position. But it's actually a source of time. We're starting to see reports of the clocks on board airplanes during spoofing events start to do weird things. You know, initially, we were starting to see very minor errors. So maybe it would jump forward a minute or so. Maybe it would even go back. And in that situation, pilots were advised, it's part of their quick reference handbook, to switch back to the local clock on the airplane rather than rely on the GPS one that was doing weird things. This is an incident I was uh, party to. The GPS time did something really weird. It rolled forward a very large amount, not something that's been widely seen. Because it happened quickly, the pilots weren't able to switch the local time, and it caused a series of follow-up incidents. And you start to realize how important time is to an airplane. It started to cause the digital certificates used for electronic com um, communication to become invalid. They weren't, they weren't expired like we'd expect a certificate. They just weren't valid because the time was too far in the future. One of the first effects, and you'll probably see this, is a passenger Wi-Fi might fail. Why? Because its digital certificates aren't valid anymore. You then start to see issues around the um, cockpit, uh, sorry, the uh, controller to pilot data link communication, which requires an accurate source of time. That's now not working, so you're now back to VHF. Now, in this particular incident, the flight landed safety, safely. Pilots asked for radar vectors, and they landed fine. We expected them to land fine. That was an issue, not an issue. But you see time being a really important component of other parts of the uh, airplane communications too. So TCAS, the Collision Avoidance Service, that's what stops airplanes flying into each other. Great, we like that. The latest versions of TCAS allow for even um, less spacing, so we can use airspace more efficiently, but it's still super, super safe because we have GPS as precise sources of time. So we're starting to see TCAS causing issues. Even something as simple as logging of instance on an airplane. What do we need when we're creating logs? An accurate source of time. So what is the authoritative source of, of time on board? Well, what's the most accurate source of time? GPS. What was really interesting about this incident was that uh, the time can actually be quite hard to re-establish. Now, I've seen varying reports. I've seen time go forward. I've heard about time going back as well. But in this particular incident, there are protections in place to stop the time being rolled back. You know, why would time go back? Right? We wouldn't do that, would we? But actually, we're not quite sure whether this is just this airplane, the type of airplane, or even the manufacturer. We're not sure. There needs to be a lot more work done here. But they couldn't roll the time back. It weren't, they, there were protections in place to stop the time gap. They'd go forward, but not back. And as a result, the airplane, most of the components on it, had to be reflashed, which was a hugely expensive and time consuming maintenance problem issue. Cost directly, but most importantly, downtime on the airplane. It was down for a significant period of time 
whilst everything was reflashed and time was brought back to normal. Planes are very connected. Planes do lots of connectivity. Even something as simple as a data loader requires a source of time. The SATCOMs require a source of time. Connectivity and safety aboard airplanes needs the time to be right. So what do I take from this? Well, it's pretty straightforward to spoof GPS. It's not, not that complicated. It doesn't require much power. GPS is a very weak signal. A few watts will do it. It seems to be specific to some planes, but I think more research is needed. And also, I think as engineers become more familiar with the process, I think we'll see maintenance for incidents like this become much less disruptive, which I think is great. What is the future? Well, hybrid. Using GPS, but correlating it with systems on the ground that we know about. There are already sources of information on the ground. We've got existing nav aids on the ground that we can cross check with to make sure that the GPS position we're receiving, the GPS time we're receiving is correct. But we need to think carefully about retiring all those existing steam powered navigation aids that are on the ground. Because if we get too excited about it, we're not going to have anything to be hybrid against. Scary. Let's just put aviation aside for a moment. It's not just aviation that uses GPS. Financial services need a really accurate source of time for high frequency trading. A lot of industrial control systems use GPS. There are lots of other areas where GPS is used as a trusted source of time. And spoofing in financial services, I'm, I'm not quite sure how that would work um, because you've got a stationary target rather than something up there. But it does get you thinking, doesn't it? It does let you realize how important time is. Now, there's some further watching. I really want you to watch um, one of my colleagues in the aerospace village give a talk a bit later on. He's talking about the world of uh, PKI in airplanes. Really, really interesting and very relevant to what we've been talking about today. It's going to be in creative stage two at half past five over there, down the way there. But that's me. I hope you found it interesting. I'd be glad to take some questions if you want to come to the front. Thank you.